Well, it's 10 o'clock or it's 10 o'clock my time. <laughs> it's time to get started. <laughs> Welcome to Oxford Interfaiths Forum's inaugural session of Psalms and Interfaith Contexts, where we will explore the prayers, poems, and songs of the Psalter from multi-faith and multidisciplinary perspectives. Uh, I'm Dr. Erica Monhe Greer, and I'd like to uh, open up the session and especially welcome participants from Bulgaria, Canada, Egypt, India, Italy, Jordan, Pakistan, Philippines, Turkey, and the USA. This reading group aims to explore Psalms as a source of solace and inspiration, reflecting on their role in human well being. Our meetings will be held monthly for one hour to discuss a specific passage and its application. The main presentation will be followed by discussion and questions from the group. And today we are exploring Psalm 1. During the presentation, you may raise a question by submitting it through the chat, or when the chair opens the discussion, please raise your hand to speak. Uh, via the hand raising icon, which is easiest for us to manage. Uh, a reminder now to please mute your Zoom profile so that everyone may listen uninterrupted to the speaker. And thank you again for coming. I would now like to introduce the chair for this meeting, Reverend Dr. Bill Goodman. Bill encourages and enables lifelong learning among church leaders in the Anglican Diocese of Sheffield. He has worked in parish church ministry and teaches biblical studies in the UK and in Ethiopia. He also studied for his PhD at Sheffield, the focus of which is Psalms, Song of Songs, and Contemporary Songs. Welcome, Dr. Bill Goodman. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to be. Uh, uh, asked to introduce uh, Reverend Dr. John Goldingay tonight, um, who was my former tutor at St. John's College, Nottingham, many years back. He is actually one of the people I hold particularly responsible for my personal delight come addiction to the Hebrew scriptures. Um, as you may already know, he's the David, David Allen Hubbard Professor Emeritus of Old Testament in the School of Theology at Fuller Theological Seminary in California. Um, but now back in his native UK and living in Oxford. Um, were I to list all his publications, I think it might take about half of our allotted hour tonight, um, but suffice to say, they range from the very detailed scholarly works, um, such as his three volume Old Testament theology and his commentaries on Daniel, Isaiah, recently Genesis, uh, and of course, uh, a large three volumes on the Psalms. Um, to the, uh, the Old Testament for Everyone series, which is um, a series including his own translation of the Hebrew scriptures, while also distilling scholarly knowledge into a tight word limit and a highly accessible style suitable for a wide range of interested readers. Now, one thing I've long appreciated is his ability to make readers such as myself rethink our thinking, um, reframe our questions, readjust the lenses through which we habitually read biblical texts, um, perhaps, uh, perhaps exemplified by his response to the way some of his fellow Christians may feel the New Testament is all we need, so why bother with the Hebrew scriptures? Um, his response was to write a volume for them entitled, Do We Need the New Testament? Um, letting the Old Testament speak for itself, um, one of many that I've really valued and appreciated. So welcome, and uh, over to you, John Goldingay. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a fantastic thing that we are able to do this, and I am privileged to be the person who um, starts the thing off. And so I am looking forward, though, with some, some trepidation to what we'll do over the next hour. As I think Erica already said, uh, we're going to look at Psalm 1, uh, which kind of seemed the obvious place to start, really. Though one of the things that I shall be saying is that in another sense, it isn't an obvious place to start. It's a kind of um, ambiguous thing, really, in relation to the Psalter as a whole. But I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But, uh, but first of all, we're going to have it read. So what I'd like us to do is if, um, if Benjamin and Carenza uh, can read it in Hebrew and then Carenza will read it in English, and then I'll talk about it. So if Thea, you can display the text and we'll have Benjamin and then Carenza read it. Psalm 
Okay. Great, thank you. Ashrei ha'ish asher lo halach be'atzat rasha'im uvederach chata'im lo amad uvmoshav leitzim lo yashav. Ki im betorat aronai chefzo uvtorato yege yomam balayla v'haya ke'etz shatul al palge ma'im piryo yiten be'ito ve'alehu lo yibol v'chol asher ya'aseh yatzliach. Lo chen harasha'im ki im kamotz asher tidfenu ruach al ken lo yakumu rasha'im b'mishpat v'chata'im ba'adat tzadikim. I think I need to scroll down for one more verse. Or scroll up, I'm not sure. No, it's up the top of the, yeah. Oh, Sorry. Uh, ki, ki yodea adonai derech tzadikim v'derech v'shanim toved. Tov. Toda raba. Uh, Karenza. Okay. Happy is the man who has not followed the counsel of the wicked, or taken the path of sinners, or joined the company of the insolent. Rather, the teaching of the Lord is his delight, and he studies that teaching day and night. He is like a tree planted be beside streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose foliage never fades, and whatever it produces thrives. Not so the wicked, Rather, they are like chaff that wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not survive judgment, nor will sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord cherishes the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Thank you. Well, now, it must be that in a sense, Psalm 1 would be an appropriate beginning to the Psalter. On the other hand, in another sense, it, it isn't because it's not typical. Because when you read on in the book of Psalms, um, you don't find that the kind of um, thing that Psalm 1 is, is typical of the book of Psalms as a whole. Uh, it, well, Psalm 2 isn't typical either in a way, though it does introduce the theme of the, the king who is going to, going to be an important person through the book of Psalms. But then Psalm 3 starts, O oh Lord, how many are my foes? And Psalm 4 starts, answer me when I call, O God of my right. And Psalm 5 starts, give ear to my words, O Lord, give, give heed to my sighing. Psalm 6, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Psalm 7, O Lord, my God, you I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers. So these are ways of talking to God, which are a bit surprising after you've read Psalm 1. Psalm 8 is quite different. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the world. And Psalm 9 is different again. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. What you get in Psalms 3 to 9, then, is much more um, typical of the kind of thing that the book of Psalms is. Not in the proportion um, of the uh, cries of protest to praise and thanksgiving that those few happen to represent. But those three ways of speaking to God um, are the kind of thing that the, that the book of Psalms is characteristically doing. Uh, it's praising God in the way that Psalm 8 is. Lord, how, Lord our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the world. It's protesting to God about how, how grim things are in the way that Psalms 3 uh, to uh, 7 are. And then it's giving thanks to God in the way that Psalm 9, 9 is. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Because the presupposition is that you've protested to God in the way that Psalms 3 to 7 have said. And then God has done something about the thing you protested. And now, now you're in a position to come back to God uh, to say thank you for what God has done and give your testimony to what God has done. So praise and protest and thanksgiving. They are the characteristic um, motifs that run through the Psalms. My guess is you could probably allocate about 130 of the Psalms to one, another, one or other of those categories. Psalm 1, then, isn't like that. So why does it come first? Psalm 1 is an introduction to the book of Psalms, nevertheless, in several ways. First, there is the fact that it tells you um, that you need to be living by Torah. It introduces, it relates Torah living to the nature of the Psalms. And it does that maybe in two different ways. 
one of the interesting features of the book of Psalms as a whole is that as you read through it from time to time, it tells you that you've come to the end of one collection and the beginning of another collection. And there are five of those of these collections uh, at the end uh, of um, a, a number of different Psalms. You get a blessing and an amen that tells you that you've come to the end of a collection. And in English translations, it tells you that you're moving from book one to book two, from book two to three, to book three and so on. It doesn't do that in the Hebrew text, but the Hebrew text does make the point clear that it's a transition by, by virtue of these alleluias and amens. And it turns out that the book of Psalms is five books of Psalms. Oh, well, why would you have five books of Psalms? Because there are five books in the Torah, silly. So that when, the, when Psalm 1 uh, talks about learning, reading Torah, then one of the things it reminds you of, maybe one of the things it has in mind, one of the things that the um, people who put the book of Psalms together maybe had got in mind, is that when you read the book of Psalms, you're reading something that's rather like the Torah, and that, and that in, in the way that it um, comprises these five books. So that as the Torah is a guide to what God has done for his people, and a guide to the kind of life that God expects of his people. The book of Psalms is then a parallel guide to the way in which we talk to God in praise and in protest and in prayer. It's, it's a guidebook to the life of praise and prayer uh, for the Israelite congregation that's then taken over um, by the Christian church. So Psalm 1 is a good introduction to the book of Psalms because it's, it's inviting you to see what follows as Torah. But probably in the actual wording of the book of Psalms, when it talk, in the actual wording of Psalm 1, when it talks about Torah, it's not thinking about the book of Psalms. I think my suspicion is that the compilers of the book of Psalms were reading it that way, but the author of Psalm 1 himself um, uh, didn't see it that way. When he says, you've got to be Torah people. He's not got in mind you're taking seriously the book of Psalms as itself Torah. He's thinking about you taking seriously the Torah. So the person who reads the book of Psalms needs to be someone for whom the teaching, the Torah of the Lord is his delight. And he studies that teaching day and night. In other words, you can't actually make the most of the book of Psalms. You can't work by its praise and its protest and its prayer if you are, unless you are also a person who lives by the Torah in the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy sense. Uh, and that's the uh, point that Psalm 1 uh, makes in the way that it talks about the life uh, of a person in which it draws, in which it makes a contrast between the person who is faithful, the person who walks by the Torah, and the person who is faithless, who doesn't walk by the Torah. Before you um, think you're going to be able to praise God, or protest to God, or give thanks to God, you need to be a Torah person in that other sense, or perhaps rather alongside your being a person who praises and prays and, uh, and gives thanks. You need to be the other kind of Torah person because otherwise God isn't going to be very interested um, as the Torah it points out and as the prophets like to point out. So Psalm 1 is a good introduction to uh, the book of Psalms for those two reasons to do with um, the, the nature uh, of, uh, of a life with God that the book of Psalms will, will go on to um, to describe. Uh, it invites us then to delight in what follows, though sometimes um, it uh, we'll find that it says things that are rather kind of shocking. Um, so then it's inviting us to treat it as Torah. Uh, and, it, and it makes promises to us about if we are Torah people, uh, then there will be um, something for us in relation to God that comes. So happy is the man who has not followed the counsel of the wicked 
or taken the path of sinners or joined the company of the insolent. Rather, the teaching of the Lord is his delight and he studies that teaching day and night. And then there's the promise. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, whose foliage never fades and whatever it produces thrives. Except that, as those Psalms that follow indicate, it doesn't always work like that. So Psalm 1, amongst other things, makes outrageous promises to you. Not so the wicked, rather they are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not survive judgment, nor, nor will sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord cherishes the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. So when you go on to read the rest of the book of Psalms, you read it recognizing that there's a tension between the realities of the way in which life works out uh, and the um, kind of promises that Psalm 1 gives you at the very beginning. Psalm 1 in that respect uh, makes you think a bit um, about Proverbs, which gives outrageous accounts of how God's faithfulness works out, which often make us want to say, no, it doesn't. Um, uh, and, and, and that's why it's important that Ecclesiastes and Job complement Proverbs uh, in those kind of books. And so the beginning of the book of Psalms and then the content of the book of Psalms complement each other and stand in tension with each other. What I want to do now is to uh, read a sermon um, on Psalm 1. Not a sermon of mine, um, but a, a sermon uh, by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was a uh, Baptist preacher of the last century. This is a sermon or, or an abbreviated version because he's a Baptist preacher and um, Baptist preachers go on rather a lot. Um, it's an abbreviated version of a sermon that he preached in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in Newington in London on November the 13th, 1864. And one reason why I want to read it is this. Our interfaith meetings um, are, um, they're kind of confusing about what categories they put you in. Because I'm here um, as, as a Christian. I mean, I am uh, uh, an Anglican clergyman. Um, and yet uh, I'm also uh, an Old Testament scholar, as Bill has pointed out. Uh, and so I don't necessarily find that the way that I read um, the Old Testament is actually any different uh, from the way in which a Jewish scholar would read it. So I'm kind of um, caught really between two bits of identity. Um, when uh, I was uh, living in California, I uh, got an email uh, uh, one day from a Jewish lawyer in Los Angeles who, who'd written uh, a book to persuade um, Jews not to become Christians. And he wanted me to read the manuscript of this book in order to make sure that what he'd said um, about Christians, and in particular about Christian use of the Hebrew scriptures, was fair. Um, so I read it, and the kind of things that he said about passages in the Old Testament that Christians often quote was entirely fair as a as statements about the uh, historical, the, the natural, the, um, the, the readerly meaning um, of these uh, passages in the Old Testament. So I said, yeah, that was fine. And so he put something on the back of the book and I think it got quoted on Amazon that I had approved of it. And I got in trouble then with Christians uh, for saying that um, his, his uh, understanding of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew scriptures was right. There's a kind of tension um, uh, for, uh, for some of us anyway. Uh, and, but because I am here as a Christian scholar, I thought you ought to hear what an ordinary Christian might say about Psalm 1. So in a minute, I'm going to read this abbreviated version of Charles Haddon Spurgeon's sermon on Psalm 1. But first, I'm going to ask Diane uh, to read the other, another translation of Psalm 1, and then we'll go into the sermon. Diane. Good morning. We're in, we're in California time. Good morning. Psalm 1. The blessings of someone who has not walked by the counsel of the faithless. 
or stood on the way of wrongdoers or lived in the settlement of the arrogant. Rather, his delight is in Yahweh's instruction. And he murmurs about his instruction day and night. He's like a tree planted by channels of water, which gives its fruit in its time. And its foliage doesn't fade. All that he does succeeds. Not so the faithless people. Rather, they're like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the faithless don't rise up when a ruling is given, nor wrongdoers in the assembly of the faithful. Because Yahweh acknowledges the way of the faithful, but the way of the faithless perishes. Thank you. So here's Charles Haddon Spurgeon. It's an old saying and possibly a true one that every man is seeking after happiness. If it be so, then every man should read this psalm. For this directs us where happiness is to be found in the highest degree and purest form. Blessed, says David, is such and such a man. And the word which he uses is in the original exceedingly expressive. It implies a sort of plurality of blessednesses. We'll begin by considering who the blessed man is. The description given of him is simply this, that he is a man. There are moral qualities, there, there are moral qualities given, but the only thing said of him in the first place is that he's a man. Here is something very suggestive. For he is a person subject to the common sorrows of humanity. Being a man, he is also subject to infirmities. More than this, it appears that he has to endure the same temptations that we have. The way of sinners often crosses his path. The seat of the scornful is sometimes next door to his own, or even under the same roof. He is subject to like passions and tempted in all points as we are. And yet he is blessed. Only a man, but much more than he would have been had God, had God not blessed him. Observe too, he does not hold any eminent position. It is not, blessed is the king, blessed is the scholar, blessed is the rich, but blessed is the man. This blessedness is as attainable by the poor, the forgotten, and the obscure, as by those whose names figure in history and are trumpeted by fame. He is a man, and nothing but a man, though grace makes him much more. The psalm reveals to us too, that in order to secure his blessedness, he is a man needing help. He is likened to a tree. He must drink of the rivers of water, and so this man must live upon divine grace. His way is said to be known to the Lord, implying that God's approval of his way brings him strength. There is in this psalm, however, one word that truly describes this man, and that is that he is a righteous man. Observe the last verse. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. This is the description of the blessed man, but still I beg you to remember, he's only a man. Now we get following on this, what the blessed man avoids. The divinely blessed man avoids the common way of ungodly persons. The tragic folly and sin of these people is that they have neglected the chief thing to be remembered, namely that there is a God, that they are his creatures, and that being his creatures, ought to be, uh, they ought to live to him. But they give God no part of their lives, and he is in none of their thoughts. The blessed man, however, avoids this. He sees that God, who fills all things, ought to fill his thoughts, and that the great end of his being should be to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that's a quotation from the Westminster Confession of Faith. It is chiefly here that the godly man differs from others. He does not consider first how the world regards a thing, but how God looks at it. In the next place, he avoids the way of sinners. 
Let a thing be belabeled sin in God's book, and though men may laugh at it, call it a mere, a, a mere joke, a piece of flim, a peccadillo, the godly man accepts God's labeling of it and leaves the way of sinners. Let it be never so smoothly turfed and, and grassed over so attractively. The true Christian shuns the seat of the scornful. It makes his blood boil when he hears God's name profaned. His heart is full of horror because of the wicked who obey not God's law. Though he is told to prove all things, that's a quote from St. Paul, he knows that a very slight test is enough for some things, and he puts them quickly aside to hold fast only that which is good. Once more, he avoids the very persons of sinners, except so far as he has to deal with them in civil matters and the common courtesies and duties of life. And now for the third truth of God here insisted on, wherein the blessed man delights. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Man must have some delight, some supreme pleasure. His heart was never meant to be a vacuum. It is that if not filled with the best things, it will be filled with the unworthy and disappointing. If we take our religion as men do medicine, it is of little good to us. Some folks go to the house of God as you might suppose criminals would go to the whipping pool, whipping post. The true Christian has his holy delights and chief among them is his reveling in the law of the Lord, the word of God. Why do Christians delight in it? Because it is God's law. Anything belonging to God should delight the believer. Because it com comes with divine authority to us and so brings confidence and joy to our hearts. Because of its antiquity. And we delight in it because of the justice of it. We prize the book too because of its lofty wisdom. Here in this book of God, we learn of his love to us. Because it is true. Again, we delight in it because it's pleasant, because it's profitable. This book enriches us with the best of wealth and stored up treasure for all eternity. Now, gathering up all these reasons, I want earnestly to ask each of us here, do you delight in this book? But I must hasten on to ask, what occupies the blessed man's time? In his law doth he meditate day and night. May I ask whether there are some here who do not meditate on God's word at all? If so, then this solemn thought will seize us. If you have not the blessedness of God's word, you must inherit its, inherit its curse. This brings us now to the very centre of the psalm's teaching. Wherein is this man so, div so divinely blessed? He, he is blessed, first of all, for life. He shall be like a tree, not a dry, dead, sapless pole. His life is such that unregenerate men are strangers to it. He has been begotten again unto a living hope. That's again a quote from the New Testament. The sap of God's grace is in him. He has stability. The tree planted, well rooted in the ground. He has too the gladness of growth. The tree remains not the sapling, but grows upward, downward, abroad, spreading its branches. So the godly man is always learning more of his heavenly father and endeavouring to be more conformed to the image of his Lord. He has the blessing too of favoured position, planted by God himself, not self-sown or the foundling of the wind. If he is a servant, he believes God has put him where he should be. Poor or rich, he learns to be content for he is a tree divinely planted. He is well sustained. Whatever is really good for him, God has pledged himself to give. Not a tree in the desert, but placed where the rivulets come rippling to his roots. He's, he hears his master say, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily, verily thou shalt be led. He has yet again beauty in God's sight, beauty of an unfading kind. His leaf also shall not wither. When personal beauty decays by reason of old age, 
and beauty of, of wit and learning be assailed by approaching death, still he shall be fair in the likeness of his master as a young olive tree and grow as a cedar in the court of his God. And to crown it all, he has constant prosperity. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He may not grow rich, but he still prospers. This metaphor of the flourishing tree is a very beautiful one. See it there, always green, loaded with fruit, standing where it can never know drought. If God has taught us to delight in his law, that is our true picture and portrait. Is it now? Is it ours? But to close, here we are made to ask, who is this blessed man's guardian? There must be somebody who takes care of him or he couldn't be blessed. Ah, the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Are you so depressed? Do waves of grief roll over your soul? Well, pour out your heart to God, for he knows and knows how to help. If the Lord did not look after us in our best days, we should perish by the sunstroke of too much prosperity. And if he did not watch over us in our worst days, we should be frost killed by the cruel Arctic winds of adversity. But says one, how may I begin this way? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And this is the fear of the Lord, to trust your soul in the hands of God, appoint, of, a God of God's appointed saviour and know you're safe. If your very soul sings that, you're on the road to true blessedness and all that is in this psalm shall be yours in life, in death, and throughout eternity. May God bless you thus. Amen. Uh, well, there's, there's Spurgeon, and I'm done for at least for a while, and Bill now is going to introduce some discussion. And he needs to unmute. He does. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, Okay, the floor is open really for comments, questions. Um, if you're like me, a slow thinker, you may need time to sort of distill your question. Other people may be quicker thinkers. Um, as mentioned earlier, there's the chat and there's the hand function under reactions on your bottom of your screen. Reactions offers you a, a waving hand one. So um, do fire away. I see Sandy. Sandy.